at the last plenary lecture of, of the conference is a very special one uh, in the sense that it is named after Paul Gast, who was uh, a very uh, distinguished geochemist who unfortunately uh, passed away rather prematurely at a very young age. He was a professor at Columbia University and in fact was the first recipient of the uh, Goldschmidt Award back in 1972, so that's almost 40 years ago. Uh, today's speaker is uh, Professor Victoria Offen from the California Institute of Technology, uh, where she has been on the faculty since uh, 2004. Uh, Victoria earned her PhD at the University of California in Santa Barbara, which is where I earned mine as well. And um, she tells me that uh, uh, she also spent a great deal of time at the Monterey Bay uh, Aquarium Research Institute because just before she finished her PhD, her advisor took another position. Uh, I think some of you relate to that. And although Victoria was trained um, during her graduate school days uh, primarily as a molecular microbiology, micro, microbial ecologist. Uh, she has maintained some very broad interests and in fact works very closely uh, with geologists and geochemists. She calls herself a geomicrobiologist but works very closely uh, with people in this community. Uh, she did her postdoc at the um, NASA Ames Research Center as a National Research Council Fellow and uh, worked with David Demarius uh, while there. And while doing her postdoc, she very much expanded her uh, analytical toolbox so that today she does work with molecular methods, uh, stable isotopes, organic geochemistry uh, to characterize uh, microbial organisms that we call um, methanogenic uh, microorganisms. Uh, Victoria's work has been recognized with a number of awards. Uh, let me just mention a couple. Uh, in 2005, uh, she was awarded the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation Young Investigator Award. And then just this past year, uh, she was awarded the uh, Department of Energy Early Career Research Award. Um, I'm messing up my words here. Never mind. Okay, so I won't make you listen to me for much longer. So let me just say that uh, today, uh, Victoria is going to speak to us about microbial partnerships and methane oxidation in the deep sea. So please join me in welcoming Victoria for her plenary lecture. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yep, right on. Yep, yep. All right. So I'd like to um, first uh, thank the nominating committee. It's uh, truly a privilege to, to be here and have the opportunity to present some of the ongoing research in my lab group uh, related to methane oxidation uh, in deep sea environments, and in particular, looking at the microorganisms that are capable of, of harnessing energy uh, from methane coupled to, to sulfate in anoxic um, sediments. So my talk today is going to focus mostly on these microorganisms, the types of um, compatible partnerships they form with, with sulfate-reducing bacteria, and then the overall role they play in the structuring of uh, these methane-driven ecosystems in uh, the deep sea. Now, this process of anaerobic oxidation of methane was actually 
first discovered by geochemists um, back in the late 70s, um, but looking at pore water um, profiles and, and isotopic distributions in continental margin sediments. And so they suggested that sulfate could be used as an electron acceptor for methane. Um, but the actual organisms that were capable of catalyzing this process weren't discovered until um, maybe just a little over 10 years ago uh, now. And so this is sort of right at the period of time where I was uh, engaged in my, in my PhD, and so I was fortunate enough to, to be able to, to get involved in this uh, early on in looking at uh, these microorganisms. And uh, there's a number of folks, um, graduate students and collaborators that I wanted to acknowledge. Um, and whose work I will try to uh, highlight throughout this, this talk. Okay, so I recognize you probably have a pretty broad um, range of, of backgrounds here in the audience, and so I thought I would start off by um, giving you guys some overview on some of the, the overarching goals we have uh, in the field of microbial ecology or those people uh, who work on modern uh, geobiological problems in extant um, ecosystems. And that is really trying to make sense of uh, this, this sea of diversity that we see in many natural ecosystems and trying to link identity of, of specific groups of organisms with their actual uh, metabolic potential and their function in geochemical um, cycles uh, and interactions in a natural uh, context. And it turns out that this uh, is a bit of a, a challenge, predominantly because most of the diversity that we um, are able to see in the environment using DNA um, sequencing tools, like looking at ribosomal RNA, um, suggests that the diversity is far greater than those organisms that we have in, in culture collection. And so there's huge branches on this tree of life that have no known culture representatives, and we really don't have any sense of what these organisms are, are doing in their roles in the cycling of elements uh, in nature. That being said, um, it's actually a really exciting time to be involved in the field of, of microbial ecology, and I think we're closer than ever uh, in, in making these, these direct linkages in a, in a meaningful way. And um, this is due to large part to some revolutionary technological advances um, in the field. The first uh, being uh, DNA molecular sequencing has become much more high throughput and also a lot cheaper. And so this has made uh, the genomes of, of both cultured and uncultured organisms accessible to us. And these genomes essentially provide a blueprint for metabolic potential, so we can kind of infer what these organisms might be doing in the environment by looking at gene inventories. The second um, has to do with uh, techniques that allow us to start probing the activities of these organisms at scales that are much more meaningful to the microorganisms themselves. So there's a lot of microanalytical uh, tools that are allowing us to go into the environment and start querying the activity and potential of, of individual microorganisms in nature. Okay, and so I like this uh, graph here because it gives us a sense of sort of the physical scale. So many of the, the geochemists in the room are, are sort of focused on the biogeochemical cycling of elements on a broad scale. Um, and early microbial ecology studies would sort of look at the overall community structure, what's the diversity in the environment. Uh, but really, if we get down into the micron and submicron scale, this is really the realm where we start to look at the individual differences between microorganisms, their interactions, and the small-scale cycles of, of nutrients and energy between organisms that then can help us inform these broader questions in, in terms of geochemical cycling. So, uh, so looking at a range of scales actually gives us a much more richer picture of what's going on in these complex natural environments. Okay, so to give you some examples, um, this is some work that was done by a former postdoc in my lab, David Fike. And um, in this case, we were looking at uh, biologically produced uh, sulfides in a microbial mat um, and using secondary ion mass spectrometry, or so, um, SIMS, uh, essentially to look at the fine scale structure and isotopic variability of sulfides across these very steep um, chemocline in the mat system. So these microbial mats are finely laminated ecosystems. They have um, very steep 
redox gradients that uh, change on the order of, of sub millimeter scale. And so these are really difficult systems to look at um, with sort of conventional techniques. Uh, and so what we were able to do is essentially capture this um, sulfide from the mat, maintaining its spatial scale, and then analyze in a grid pattern uh, the distribution of sulfide isotopes across the chemocline. And so what you can see here is the, in this sort of uh, 2D plot, the warmer colors represent more enriched isotope values, and the cooler colors represent uh, more depleted. And we see that across small spatial scales, we range over uh, 45 per mil difference. And some of these extremes in isotope differences are occurring on the scale of a few tens of microns. So if we compare this to uh, sort of conventional analyses, we might be able to get maybe five, six data points of averaged um, sulfide isotope information. And so a lot of this, this fine scale structure and variability uh, essentially would be lost um, without these sort of microanalytical tools. Okay, so that's looking at sort of m microbial metabolic products, um, and that in itself is, is a big advancement in terms of looking at uh, structure that's meaningful for the microorganisms. But uh, what's even more effective is if you can begin to couple these uh, geochemical tools with microbiological analyses. And so, um, and really sort of looking at this, this broad tool set allows us to begin to make links between these organisms and uh, their interactions and cycling of various elements in the environment. So uh, using microscopy to actually image organisms and their specific interactions, uh, looking at diversity with uh, gene-based analyses, and then also metagenomic and other types of omics techniques all provide us with context on the, the community that can then be framed uh, with biogeochemistry and stable isotopes um, on a variety of scales. Okay. All right, so I showed you um, some examples in terms of the variability of microbial metabolic products. Um, we can also use secondary ion mass spectrometry to, to query individual cells in the environment as well. And this gives us information either on the isotopic composition of organisms or elemental uh, distribution um, without having to grow these organisms in the lab. And so the way that this uh, technique works essentially is SIMS allows you to uh, focus a, a fine primary ion beam. Uh, the di diameter of this beam ranges anywhere from 10 microns down to uh, 50 nanometers, depending on the instrument. Secondary ions are generated from the surface of your sample, and essentially they're passed down through a mass spec and you can get um, isotopic or elemental information on these organisms. Uh, and so if we take this type of, of tool and couple it with fluorescent DNA probes, we can now specifically target uh, or organisms in natural samples that we have some information about phylogenetic identity. And so in this case, I'm showing you three distinct cells that are all targeted with different fluorescently labeled DNA probes. And so um, using SIMS, we're able to go into the system then and get information, for example, on the carbon isotope distribution of these three cells that may co-occur in the environment. This can give us some information on what carbon sources are using and, and other things. Okay, so we've been applying this kind of approach in particular to study uh, deep sea uh, methane cycling in, uh, in these environments that are called cold seeps. And so these are localized hot spots on the seafloor where methane is advecting up towards the seabed, and it meets dif downward diffusing sulfate. And in this realm, there are microorganisms that are essentially capable of stripping electrons off of methane and coupling it to reduce um, sulfi sulfate to hydrogen sulfide. And then that hydrogen sulfide, in turn, fuels uh, symbiotic communities at the seabed, such as these chemosynthetic uh, clams with sulfide oxidizing symbionts in these uh, sulfide by oxidizing bacterial mats. So these cold seep systems typically occur along continental margin areas in um, zones where there may be gas hydrate dissolution or gas reservoir uh, discharge or dewatering events. Um, the actual aerial extent of these environments is, is poorly understood. 
But what we do know is that this little partnership um, uh, that's driving anaerobic methane oxidation uh, is very effective biological filter for methane in these environments and essentially scavenging the majority of the methane before it gets up into uh, the water column. Now another byproduct in addition to, to hydrogen sulfide production is uh, that this, this process itself generates alkalinity and leads to the production of, um, of carbonate in many of these environments. And so, uh, and in this talk, I'm going to focus on both of these types of, of habitats. Okay. All right, so I'll show you a cartoon essentially of how this symbiotic partnership uh, works. So we have, the, the way that we know it now is that there's a uh, methane consuming archaea um, shown here in this Fluorescence Institute hybridization image um, as stained in red. Uh, these organisms oxidize the methane to some internal electron transfer agent. And this, uh, these electrons then are passed to sulfate um, through a sulfate reducing bacterium here um, shown by these cells stained in green on the outside. So this is the overall net reaction that these organisms um, cooperatively catalyze. Um, the amount of free energy that's gained from this process is, is pretty meager, anywhere between 20 to minus 40 kilojoules per mole. And this is uh, free energy that these organisms have to share. So they live a very uh, uh, energy poor existence in these environments. And there's many aspects of this electron transfer feature that is are poorly understood at this point. What we do know is that in order for this uh, reaction to be efficient, we need to have a uh, very efficient transfer of these electrons to the sulfate reducing partner in order to catalyze uh, methane oxidation. Okay. So since the first discovery of these methane consuming um, archaea, we now know that there's uh, quite a bit of diversity of organisms that are capable of this process and form these physical partnerships with sulfate reducing bacteria. Uh, these organisms or groups are called ANME. And um, the, to date, there are no known cultured representatives of these organisms. So most of what we've learned has been looking at environmental samples um, and doing manipulation uh, types of experiments. Uh, most of these organisms are close cousins of known methanogenic organisms, uh, such as the methanococcoides, methanosarcina, um, and many fall within the methanosarcinales order. Others form their own lineage here, um, order, their own order between methanomicrobiales and methanosarcinales. Okay, so to give you a little bit of history on how these organisms were discovered, um, this really came from collaborative uh, efforts between organic geochemists and, and microbial ecologists um, uh, looking at lipid biomarkers within methane seep sediments uh, combined with these phylogenetic analyses of uh, the community uh, structure using DNA. And this was work done by Kai Heinrichs and colleagues back in 1999. And what Kai was able to show was that in active methane seeps where methane oxidation was occurring, uh, there were uh, archaeal biomarkers, archaeal and hydroxyarchaeal, that were extremely depleted in carbon-13, which suggested that the source organism had assimilated methane. And the interesting thing is that this um, particular biomarker, this SN2 hydroxyarchaeal, uh, is known to be common in members of the methanogenic order methanosarcinales. So this really fit in with the, the DNA uh, sequences that were found in this environment and really suggested that these novel clades of ANME sequences might be the source organism and involved in methane oxidation. Okay. So if we look a little more closely at the diversity within these groups um, using DNA probes and, and fluorescent stains, we see that within each of these clades, there's quite a bit of complexity. So we have organisms that are found devoid of a bacterial partner, whereas others form associations. Uh, the physical structure of these associations differs depending on environmental context. Um, and, and really, the big question is whether or not these, these variations that you see oftentimes co-occurring within the same habitat actually yield uh, meaningful ecophysiological differences between 
uh, the organisms. And if you want to get at questions related to cell-specific differences, really these sort of microanalytical tools that allow us to query uh, individual organisms are the best way to approach this. If you look at bulk isotopes of, of lipids, for instance, you're never going to be able to, to separate those organisms that are found on their own versus those that are in associations, for example. Okay. All right, so uh, to look at the, the variation between these, these different groups, uh, we used uh, fluorescence in situ hybridization coupled with secondary ion mass spectrometry, or fish sims, and use these, these specific DNA probes to go into the environment and look at the isotopic distribution of carbon within individual cells. And so if you're interested in methane-based ecosystems, uh, looking at the delta C13 values of biomass is actually a really um, convenient uh, natural tracer to look for organisms that have assimilated methane. And this is uh, nicely articulated here in this graph that's showing you sort of the range in carbon-13 values for uh, different main sources of carbon within marine ecosystems. And you can see here that methane, in particular biogenic methane, is extremely depleted in carbon-13 relative to other uh, carbon sources in, in the environment. So uh, those organisms that actively are assimilating that methane into biomass will, too, um, show this isotopically depleted signature uh, within their biomass, and we can then trace that by SIMS. We also see the metabolic products produced, carbonate, bicarbonate, um, and TOC within these active ecosystems also shifting towards uh, lighter values. Okay, so let's look at some of the data. Um, this was work that was done in collaboration with uh, my colleague Chris House at Penn State. And uh, essentially in this study we took a single core within a methane seep environment that was actively venting methane. Um, and we looked at four depth horizons, so depth is uh, here on the y-axis, and delta C13 values are across the top here. And we looked at um, methane oxidizing archaea, or putative methane oxidizing archaea, um, that existed either by themselves, in this case, or forming associations, and then also looked at other types of bacteria in this, this ecosystem. So each of the points that you see here represents an averaged value uh, for one of these groups that's uh, color-coded. So for example, if we look at the bacteria that are listed by these asterisks here, we see that the, most of the bacteria have values that are much more similar to typical marine organic carbon. However, if we start to look at the isotopic variation of some of these methane oxidizing archaeal groups, like this ANME-1 uh, organism here that's represented by these uh, diamonds, we see that in some horizons they have a, up to a 60 per mil variation within uh, their carbon isotopic composition. Uh, again, within a single uh, three centimeter horizon. And so, um, and the same thing occurs down here with the NME2, where we have, it uh, looks like, two populations, one at about minus 25 per mil and the other about minus 75 uh, per mil. And so, this sort of range that you see in carbon isotope space really does suggest that these organisms uh, are doing something metabolically different within the environment, possibly one group that is uh, more methanogenic-like, so methane-producing, and another that is methane-consuming. Uh, and if we compare this data to rate measurements uh, in these environments, indeed, we do see co-occurrence of both methanogenesis and methanotrophy going on in, in some of these horizons. So, so it may be that these organisms are a little more metabolically versatile than we uh, previously believed. And looking at these systems with bulk um, types of approaches, essentially you would, you would lose all of this rich information that might help us uh, interpret the overall geochemical um, cycles that are going on in these ecosystems. Okay. All right, so that sort of tells us the natural variability in carbon isotope space if you grab a sample directly out of the environment. Uh, we are also interested in looking to see if there's any advantage to being in uh, partnerships or associations with, with each other relative to those that are found on their own? Does it influence their overall activity? And so to do this, we um, took samples directly from uh, the environment and set up some pulse chase experiments using 
N15 labeled uh, ammonium and use that ammonium to trace it into new protein synthesis in the cell. So this gives us sort of a general proxy of activity of cells under conditions supporting methane oxidation. And then again, we used uh, SIMS to analyze now the enriched N15 values within uh, these cells under these conditions. Okay, so this uh, data has been split out into organisms that formed partnerships and those that were found uh, on their own. So delta C13 values are here on the y-axis, and then enrichment in N15 in atom percent is shown here on the X. And so what we see is that those uh, organisms that are in these physical consortia with sulfate-reducing bacteria are significantly more active in making new proteins under conditions supporting methane oxidation uh, in these incubations relative to those uh, single cells of bacteria, sulfate-reducing bacteria and archaea that were found uh, co-occurring in these incubations on their own. So this really does suggest that there's a a physical advantage under methane oxidation conditions um, to being in close association with one another. Okay. So I mentioned in the beginning that uh, genomic information can give us sort of a blueprint or a roadmap of, of metabolic potential in, in organisms. And uh, indeed, we've been using uh, metagenomic tools to, to provide clues to the potential metabolism of, of these organisms. And this is sort of showing you an overview of some of the gene content uh, within these, these organisms. And um, what caught our attention was the presence of genes involved in various forms of nitrogen metabolism associated with these uh, methane oxidizing uh, ecosystems. And so we wanted to follow up and look at the role of nitrogen in structuring these, these uh, environments. And in particular, uh, what we discovered was that there were genes that were indicative of uh, the ability to fix nitrogen in the environment, the nitrogenase uh, genes, as well as genes involved in either nitrate assimilation or denitrification. And so, looking a little more closely, um, first at the nitrogen fixation uh, question, we looked at the sort of phylogeny of, of these genes that were recovered from the seep environment, and what we found was a distinctive clade of sequences that were populated only by sequences recovered from methane seep environments, so no close cultured relatives. And uh, because of that, and its divergent from, uh, divergence from some of these other known groups, it's very difficult to make any sort of inference into where these genes are coming from, who the source organism is. And so, uh, and of course, just finding genes in the environment doesn't necessarily mean these genes are, are active in the process. And so, to test for the potential of nitrogen fixation in these environments, we set up uh, new incubations where we added N15 labeled dinitrogen gas uh, under conditions supporting methane oxidation and asked the question of whether or not you see evidence of nitrogen fixation. And if so, are these methane oxidizing consortia the drivers of, of nitrogen fixation in this ecosystem. So this is some work uh, by my graduate student, Ann Dikas, and uh, essentially she set up two sets of incubations, uh, one paired set that had methane, the other without methane. She took samples from a very variety of, of seep environments, um, as well as samples taken outside of the seep area, and then looked at the incorporation in total N15 um, in these systems, and what she saw was that uh, under conditions uh, supporting methane oxidation, where methane was added as, as the energy source, we see incorporation or enrichment of N15 from the dinitrogen gas into the total uh, community within the seep environment. And we even see this uh, somewhat under the, the outside of the seep uh, system, and if we compare this to incubations without methane added as the, the energy source it suggests that there's a link between uh, methane and nitrogen fixation. So looking a little more closely at this question of whether or not our friends, the anaerobic methanotrophs, are, are really the, the nitrogen fixing organisms in the system, uh, we were able to, again, stain these organisms using uh, fluorescently targeted probes. Um, for the uh, methane oxidizing archaea and the sulfate reducing bacteria. 
and then analyze them uh, by SIMS. And in this case, we were using a, a nano SIMS instrument to create ion images of these cells to look at the distribution of the isotopic uh, label within these organisms. And so you can see the warmer colors here represent more enrichment in the N15 label. And, um, and so if we look at sort of the spatial relationships between where the methane oxidizing archaea sit relative to the sulfate reducing bacteria, we see that most of the enrichment appears to be localized to these methanotrophic uh, amines, suggesting that they're the primary nitrogen fixers uh, in, in these consortia. Now we also see some evidence of nitrogen assimilation by uh, the sulfate reducing bacteria, and this may suggest that there's fixed nitrogen being passed between these syntrophic partners uh, in this ecosystem. So this is uh, an important observation uh, in two ways. One, this suggests that these organisms uh, may be able to bring new nitrogen into these methane-rich uh, ecosystems, and, and two, uh, because the energy yield of the methane oxidation process is, is so meager, that coupling this really expensive anabolic process of, of nitrogen fixation uh, with methane oxidation sort of sets a new limit on, on how these organisms are, are capable of coupling really difficult anabolic processes with uh, very energy uh, challenging metabolism. So, uh, so we're very uh, interested in, in following up more on that question. Okay, so I've, I've focused a lot on the diversity of, of the archaea. It turns out that the bacterial partners are also uh, diverse as well. Um, I'm showing you here a couple of the main sulfate-reducing bacterial partners that form associations with these methane-oxidizing archaea, uh, one associated with uh, the desulfosarcina sarsina and the other found within the desulfosarcina bulbaceae, shown here in, in green. Um, and uh, I have another student, uh, Abby, who is interested in, in looking at the physiological differences between these different sulfate-reducing partners and whether, how that influences the overall uh, symbiosis and uh, mechanism for methane oxidation uh, and ecophysiology of, of the system. And one thing of interest is that uh, within the metagenome, we see, uh, again, evidence of nitrate assimilation or denitrification uh, genes that appear to be associated with sulfate-reducing uh, lineages. And so we were interested to see if, if nitrate uh, played a role in, uh, in utilization by these, these organisms. Uh, and so this is a, a summary um, of, of some of the data. And so we set up incubations with N15 labeled nitrate under conditions supporting methane oxidation and looked um, at co the co-occurrence of these desulfo bulbous containing uh, archaea um, consortia and those that were associated with the desulfo sarsina and looked at the enrichment in N15. And so this is uh, showing you again, each one of these data points represents sort of an averaged value of N15 uh, enrichment and the desulfo bulbous appeared to assimilate a greater uh, amount of this labeled nitrate relative to their um, desulfosarcina uh, consortia, which suggests that you may have niche partitioning within these environments uh, that would give an advantage under conditions that where nitrate is available to one type of sulfate reducing partner uh, over the other. So the interesting thing is that when we did these experiments with added ammonium, we saw no difference between the organisms. So if ammonia is present, it sort of uh, normalizes the, the game, and, and both organisms may have an equal advantage in the context of nutrient availability uh, in the environment. OK. All right, so uh, I hope with these few examples, I've been able to show you that you can uh, go from sort of broad geochemical observations uh, within the environment and couple in metagenomic uh, predictions uh, to sort of refine hypotheses on how these organisms are working and then in turn be able to test hypotheses on a, a cell-specific level using some of these micro-analytical uh, uh, tools. And so I've shown this for, for seep environments, but essentially this kind of strategy could be used in any, any series of, of different types of, of habitats. Okay. So for the last bit of the talk, I was going to um, switch gears and, and talk about some of the um, work that we've been doing recently on these organisms and their association involvement in 
uh, orthogenic carbonate precipitation in the environment. So we know that this reaction leads to the production of alkalinity and precipitation of, of carbonates within uh, these ecosystems. These carbonates are uh, believed to form within the sediment horizon where methane oxidation is occurring and then later are exhumed from these environments due to uplift or, or winnowing of, of the sediments. Some of these uh, um, carbonates form extensive pavements on the ecosystem and essentially these organisms are changing the landscape in, in the deep sea, creating these, these hard grounds that in turn support animal communities that otherwise might not be able to colonize, like these mussel communities here that are attaching to uh, the rock. So in some environments we have still active methane venting and we support active chemolithic autotrophic communities within these ecosystems. In other areas we have uh, dormant conditions where the methane has essentially been uh, shut off, and, uh, and so these, these hard grounds persist, not only recording uh, past events of, of methane oxidation, but also, again, serving as a hard substrate for other types of organisms to come in and colonize. So if we look at the isotopic composition of, of these carbonates, uh, it's clear that some of the methane-derived carbon has been incorporated uh, within these uh, carbonate uh, systems, um, both within the active system as well as within the dormant. And these, these environments are significant not only in their influence on the ecology, but also from a, a geobiological perspective, sort of our, our archive records of past methane venting. And we can go back to uh, Jurassic, maybe earlier times, uh, and find evidence of these isotopically um, depleted carbonates and evidence of communities similar to the ones that we see today. Okay, So um, a lot of people are interested in, in trying to understand uh, the cycling of methane over time. These methane seep ecosystems, um, paleo seep ecosystems, have been uh, studied quite extensively, and, um, and people have even tried to make uh, paleo environmental predictions on what the environment might have been like in the past based on the types of biomarkers and such that are recovered from this. But um, very little is understood about how these communities undergo succession in, in the short term. And so uh, we've been interested in, in looking at that question, how do the communities change when you go from an active uh, seep system to one that's more quiescent over time? Do the communities change? And so when you finally get to this Cretaceous age seep, what are you looking at? Um, are you looking at a past historic window of dormancy on the seafloor, or is this really recording um, active methane oxidation? And if we look at uh, some of these seep systems, we see evidence of biomarkers that are not too unlike what we see in modern uh, seep systems today that are so things like these archaeal uh, type biomarkers that are isotopically depleted in carbon-13. So it suggests that these methane oxidizing communities uh, have persisted over uh, many millions of, of years. Okay. So looking at uh, the diversity within these carbonate ecosystems, we first looked um, at the DNA composition within active uh, carbonates. And what you see when you look at the archaea is something that looks very similar to the unlithified sediments in the environment. So dominated by methane oxidizing archaeal groups. And looking at the bacterial diversity in turn, we see a, a huge proportion of, of sulfate reducing bacteria, so um, something that's very similar to what you would see uh, in unlithified sediments. If we compare this to some of the uh, carbonates that were collected from dormant areas, um, again, if we look at the archaea, it looks very similar to, to a seep, so lots of, of methane oxidizing archaeal DNA signatures are preserved within this rock, but if we look at the bacterial communities, we start to see shifts in their overall uh, diversity with a decrease in sulfate reducing bacteria and an increase in some of these other proteobacterial groups uh, that are not known to be involved in, in methane oxidation. Okay, so, uh, so those are just DNA signatures. Um, we are also interested to see if these communities actually persist in the rocks. And so using molecular um, stains, we actually were able to visualize uh, these organisms in the carbonate matrix um, and compare it to that in active sediments. Um, this is 
work done by a student, Jeff Marlowe. And so what we see is that, um, that the overall abundance of these aggregates is, is uh, less than what you typically see in, in marine sediments, um, but the structures and diameter of, of these aggregates is, is uh, greater in active seep areas relative to those uh, in dormant um, conditions. And so, so these communities are actually maintained within the structures of the rocks. It's not just lipids and, and DNA, uh, but, but actual organisms. And the question is, are they still active? And so we did some initial labeling experiments using um, uh, deuterated methane and traced that methane into water. And so we can see here that um, carbonates collected from the active seep areas uh, show evidence of, of methane uh, oxidation relative to those that were found outside of the seep environment. But if we compare this to um, active seep sediments, we see that uh, the degree of activity is, is less, but it's still greater than uh, those inactive types of environments around. So there's a small but significant uh, community that that's, appears to be maintained within this lithified uh, ecosystem. And so uh, using N15 labeled ammonium, we were also able to show that these guys not only are capable of oxidizing methane, but actually are capable of producing new proteins even within the carbonate uh, matrix. And so this is uh, some uh, fish sims data showing you uh, these methane oxidizing consortia uh, within a, a carbonate nodule. And this is the corresponding enrichment in N15 from, from labeled uh, at, uh, ammonium. And so, so these organisms can, can persist in the rock, and this is sort of a, extends the, the range of habitats, I think, for, the, for these organisms, and uh, is an interesting area to, to continue following up on. So I'll just end with some future uh, work. So we've been working with some, some ecologists at uh, Scripps Institute of Oceanography, uh, looking at these, the role of these methane oxidizing communities in, in structuring the chemolitho autotrophic food webs. And so what we find is these carbonate environments actually support novel organisms that have isotopically depleted values, which suggests that they're feeding on methanotrophic biomass within these ecosystems, like this uh, Perugia worm with a delta C13 value of 101 per mil. Uh, doing labeling studies, we also can show track the incorporation of, of methane into uh, other bacteriovores as well. So these are really rich, um, diverse ecosystems that are sustained on the seafloor. Okay, so just to summarize, uh, we've been able to show that these methanotrophic consortia can serve as a, a link between not only carbon and sulfur, but also nitrogen cycling in the seep environment, uh, and that there are specific ecophysiological differences in nitrogen partitioning within these organisms. Um, We've been able to, uh, doing preliminary work, look at these orthogenic carbonate ecosystems. It appears that these methanotrophic consortia are maintained uh, within the lithified matrix and may sustain active methane oxidation. And most importantly, uh, I hope I've convinced you all that, that really this combination of molecular and, and isotopic methodologies or geochemical methodologies, and in particular, uh, single cell visualization techniques really adds a rich data set that, to help us understand the context of, of these microbial communities and the greater uh, geochemical cycles in, in nature. All right, so for that, I'd like to uh, acknowledge my wonderful uh, lab group, um, a number of folks from the ion microprobe labs, former postdocs, uh, and of course, funding support by uh, DOE and NASA Astrobiology, NSF, and Gordon Bennett Moore. So, there's time, I'll take a question. Otherwise, thank you for your attention. Okay, we have time for just a couple of very quick questions. And please use the microphone. No questions. Well, I have one. Okay, go ahead. Uh, it is very interesting to see that uh, the sulfur isotope in the first uh, slide that you showed, that towards the top of the mat, the sulfur isotope ratio is around plus 10, 
and uh, below that it is around minus 20 to minus 30 like that. Mm -hmm. Why you think that uh, towards the top it is so much enriched? Yes. Normally what we see is that it is more depleted towards the top. Well, so this, so that top part of the mat is right at the chemocline, so it's not necessarily all the way in the, the oxic zone. It may have to do with the rates of sulfate reduction that are going on there, which may, so if you have very high rates, you may decrease the, the fractionation factor. That's one possibility. Um, other possibilities are oxidative properties that may be removing preferentially some of the, the light uh, sulfur isotopes. But um, so there, there are a number of different options that might drive that, that enrichment um, in the system. And we haven't been able to, to fully deconvolve which one it is, but um, rates were, were uh, the top of our list at the time. Right? One, can I ask one more? Yeah. Uh, is that uh, in deeper cores, where we see sulfate methane transition zones at say 10 meter, 20 meter like that, have you seen these kinds of association in sediments from such deep sulfate methane transition zones? Yes, yeah, so that's a very good question. Um, and in most cases, we don't. We see mostly single cells in those environments. And there were some talks earlier in the week um, on methane cycling, and, and uh, the, the overall picture is emerging that, that seep environments may not behave exactly in the same way that, that these sort of diffusion-driven diffusion ecosystems uh, function. But you do see these methane oxidizing archaeal groups, just the, the types of associations um, are, are different, more single cells. Thank you. OK, one other question on the right. Yes, uh, what form of carbonate is precipitated around this, these seeps, and how does this fit in with what we know about the aragonite saturation horizon in the deep ocean? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so the dominant forms of carbonate typically are, are high mag calcite or aragonitic um, forms, occasionally dolomite. Um, uh, the dolomites are sort of their interest, an interesting separate story. Uh, typically we see aragonite fans um, in areas where you have um, biomass accumulations around them and then you see these growths of uh, aragonite, but more often than not it's kind of mudstone and uh, finely lithified high mag calcite. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Victoria. So let's uh, thank her one more time.